This is the Washington Week Webcast Extra. Hello, I'm Gwen Eiffel, and welcome to the Washington Week Webcast Extra, where we pick up online where we left off on air. I'm joined by Eamon Javers of CNBC, Molly Ball of The Atlantic, Manu Raju of CNN, and Karen Tumulty of The Washington Post. Wednesday's primetime GOP presidential debate was a three-hour marathon, so there's lots more to discuss. We'll get to that, but let's begin with the first round of debates, the so-called undercard. It was just half, about half as long, 90 minutes, and only four candidates were on the stage. Did any of them break out of the pack, Karen? Well, if it were possible, uh, Lindsey Graham, I think most people thought, had a pretty good debate, uh, if anyone saw it. It was, um, I mean, he came out and, and really kind of articulated his, his sort of point man of the hawk pack uh, position. Let's listen to what he had to say. He actually did talk about war. What I hope Republican voters, libertarian, vegetarians, Democrats, you name it, will look for somebody to lead us in a new direction, domestically, but particularly on the foreign policy front. President Obama is making a mess of the world. What I'm trying to tell you here tonight, that Syria is hell on earth, and it's not going to get fixed by insulting each other. I've been there 35 times to Iraq and Afghanistan. I am ready to be commander in chief on day one. Now, that was as sober as Lindsey Graham probably was in that debate. He was telling jokes. He's saying, when I'm president, we're going to be more drinking in the White House. He's the kind of guy you, you know from covering him on Capitol Hill, that lighthearted kind of person. Yeah, and this is why he's been so successful in politics. And every, you know, he's running South Carolina, and even though he's, uh, he's won three terms, even though he's moderate in a lot of key issues like immigration, things that are really uh, despised by the Republican base, the reason why he's been so successful is because during his campaign, he has that very lighthearted, has self-deprecating -de jokes. Uh, people really enjoy that folksy sensibility that he has on the trail. And you saw that last, you saw that on Wednesday night. Uh, but in August, during the Cleveland debate, that was a much different story. He was very flat and it really hurt him in the polls. I'm not sure if this will actually propel him into the first tier of candidates. It probably won't, but at least it shows voters kind of why he's been so successful. Politically. Also on stage were uh, Governor Bobby Jindal of Louisiana, former Governor George Pataki of New York, and... Um, and Rick Santorum, the former senator from Pennsylvania, who actually won the Iowa caucuses four years ago, and now finds himself scratching to be heard. But it's, what is the chance that any of them were able to break out like Carly Fiorina did last time and get onto the main stage? I, I just don't see it. And I, quite frankly, am wondering if there's even going to be an undercard debate the next time around. You think because of the numbers? Uh, well, the next debate happens to be on CNBC on October 28th. If ah. I can get a plug in for the uh, CNBC debate. How many <laughs> debates boss. will there be? <laughs> uh, so maybe you I'm can tell at, us whether there will I'm be an undercard. At, I'm not at liberty to discuss any of the details of what we're planning, but it's going to be fabulous, amazing. <laughs> it's going to be huge. The huge. rating's going to be spectacular. Classy Everyone should watch. You're taking Classy. your cue from Elegant. CNN yeah. over here about how to sell a debate. That's right. But there right. was this weird imbalance in the debate setup, right, where you had only four candidates in yeah. the happy hour JV debate because Jim Gilmore was polling too low and they promoted Carly Fiorina to the big leagues. So for an hour and a half, you had only four candidates and it was kind of great. You got a real sense of yeah. all of their personalities and what they all stood for, a real contrast. And then this chaotic and com an incredibly long, you know, three hours for 11 candidates where perpetually you're thinking there's somebody who's just fallen off the map or fainted because I haven't seen him in an hour. If you're and one of the, if you're one of the mar candidates on the bubble on the margins, would you rather be out on the wings of the 11 person debate or at the center of the four person Person debate where you get a lot more time. Well, I don't know. If you're Chris Christie, you're on the wings and you got 32 minutes where you didn't get to speak. Or, or That's what I mean. I mean, if you're yeah. if you're on the big stage, it's you're on the big stage, but you don't get any time and people kind of ignore you. Whereas if you're oh. on the small stage, they, or, or if you, take they all want the, the big stage. Yeah, they know. And yeah. if you know, if you're one of the people in the four person undercard debate. And then you don't perform very well, then you look even worse. Look right, right, right. <laughs> then you're outside the hall protesting at the well, next event. Yeah, that's right. Well, Tweet, live Hillary, tweeting it. Live tweeting. Live tweeting. Hillary tweeting Clinton account. was asked about what she thought about what, uh, how these debates went and how it would help Democrats, especially um, when it comes to the economy. Let's hear a little bit of what she said. I think if you look at the last uh, 35 years, actually, if you go back further, 
I think it's pretty uh, indisputable that having a Democrat in the White House is good for our economy, better for our economy than the alternative. Now, that's something which uh, her opponents would agree with, including Martin O'Malley, the former governor of Maryland, who would desperately love for there to be more debates, but seems to be losing that battle. That's right. And he's, but he's waging that battle right now with the chairman of the party. And that allows Hillary Clinton to say, oh, I'd love to have more debates. Go talk, talk about it with Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Do you see that happening? I don't have any inside information on this, but it definitely looks like the Democratic Party has, has set the debate calendar in the way that they feel is most favorable to the party's chances in the general election. They have very little motivation to change it, especially when Martin O'Malley is at 5% in the polls. But if, so, if, Maybe if, if he had a real constituency and there were actual, you know, legions of O'Malley supporters protesting the party, but O'Malley hasn't gotten any and, traction. But Bernie, who does like have another... Bernie Sanders, who does have legions of supporters, is not joining O'Malley in this quest, mm -hmm. as far as I can tell. Yeah, not but so I'm sure he would be happy for more national yeah. uh, airtime uh, as well and show that contrast with Hillary. Hillary Clinton. I do think that the Democratic Party will have to reconsider if this race continues to stay close, if Bernie starts winning some of these states and this is going to be, you know, a long campaign and maybe if Biden gets in, they'll have to consider adding debates on later in the calendar. Pressure will only mount if this race continues to stay yeah, you, well, wonder the if the, you, you wonder if the Bernie Sanders surge is sort of like early buyer's remorse among Democrats who sort of, uh, the party arranged to have what's more or less a coronation of Hillary Clinton and now there seem to be a lot of Democrats who don't want to do that as much as the party establishment, all the professional Democrats here in Washington yeah, but did want to do that. Well, in the case that O'Malley is making to the party is that it's better for the party to overall to have some attention to their candidates. So when 24 million people are watching the Republicans debate on TV, that's airtime that the Democratic Party is not getting to put their views across, to put their candidates across. That's true. I think it's really an open question whether Hillary Clinton would benefit from this kind of a setting, from more exposure like this to maybe take the edge off some of her unfavorable numbers. I think there's a case to be made that people might get tired of the email questions if they heard them over and over again in debates instead of this fractured thing where, she, where every time she answers one, it blows up. Uh, and so there, there is a case to be made that it'd be good for the front runner for the party as a whole to have more debates. I'm not sure if that's a persuasive one. Well, the next big debate is October 13th, and it's the Democrats, and we'll see whether this holds up or not. Thank you, everybody, for and thank you all for watching. While you're online, check out Washington Week's new election initiative, 16 for 2016, where you get the, we were you, the voter get to share your thoughts about the 2016 presidential election. Find out more at pbs.org slash Washington Week. And we'll see you next time on the Washington Week Webcast Extra.